Welcome back to Marching to Madness with Coach Keith Dambrod of the Duquesne Dukes. He's closing in on win number 400. You've had 390 in 20 years, Coach, as a Division I head coach at three different stops. Welcome. Well, I appreciate that, Ken. Um, if you count the smaller colleges, I'm closing in on 500. So I, I think the small college jobs are just as hard as these jobs. So I, I'm never going to discount those small college coaches. No, of course not. Anyway, you guys finished nine and nine. You were seven and seven inside the pandemic ridden season. You lose eight to the transfer portal. So what's the starting point? or what was the starting point, I guess, for 2021-22 after uh, all of this happens? Well, I, I'll tell you what, uh, 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 we, we're, we feel like we have the best team that we've had at Duquesne. Uh, obviously, it's a little early to tell that, but we feel like we have a good mix of guys. We have more guys that kind of, you know, can plug uh, certain holes that we've had in the past. Uh, obviously, the Atlantic 10 is a great league, so you can be anywhere from first to ninth and not have much difference. You know, the last, the bottom four teams generally are, are a little bit different, but, but the top nine are really hard to, to crack. Yeah. You, you have quite a restructure in there. You lose your top six scores, but Toby O'Kenny comes back. He's a leading uh, returnee. He started 10 games, but he averaged 3.7 points last season. Yeah. Most people will think, you know, that's a total rebuild, but we kind of feel like, we were fortunate because of the transfer portal and we really vetted out our guys closely. Uh, you know, we, we feel like we replaced Michael Hughes at center with Trey Williams, who, you know, was a two year starter, started 55 games at Indiana state and coach Lansing, unfortunately, you know, was let go and we were fortunate enough to get him. Uh, we signed two four men, RJ Gunner, division two player, uh, who averaged 20 points a game in division two at Lenore Ryan. And then also, uh, Kevin Easley, who was a Southern Conference freshman of the year and then had a hard time at TCU. But we feel like we've replenished those positions and then two young guards. So uh, with Leon Ayers, also a 12-point scorer at Mercer. So we feel like we've made some pretty good progress. And, you know, again, we're going to have an experienced team, but a new team. And that's mm -hmm. kind of how the transfer portal works now. As you look at who, who is returning for you, uh, like Toby and then, of course, uh, Tyson Acuff, Maceo Austin, how are they playing key roles in you being able to kind of start again and restructure rather than rebuild? Well, we like the guys we have coming back. You know, again, uh, I think, you know, they're winning guys, uh, winning mentality. Mikey Bacalja, Toby Okani, Tyson Acuff, Austin Rotrop, and then we had Big Mo Hema sitting out, mm -hmm. so... You know, we feel like we've got good depth and good pieces, uh, but, you know, we're going to be somewhat relying on some young guards. You know, obviously, I think because everybody getting the year back, I think we have eight freshmen or nine freshmen on our roster, so that's a lot. That's a, Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, we were talking just now about uh, Leon Ayers from Mercer, Kevin Easley uh, from Chattanooga via TCU. How do you envision those guys coming in and uh, contributing here right away? Well, we've had three weeks with our new guys and our old guys. So I've got a little better feel now for, you know, how I think they can contribute. But the good thing is, is guys like Kevin Easley, they've been coached by Lamont Paris and, and Jamie Dixon, you know, two excellent coaches. And, you know, Greg Lansing had Trey Williams and Greg Gary had Leon Ayers. So, uh, and then Lenore Ryan, Everett Sullivan, who played at Louisville, had him. So, like, they played for good coaches. And I think, you know, the good thing about the transfer portal is you get a chance to see uh, – you get to see every clip on those guys through Synergy. So, mm -hmm. we were able to really do our homework and make sure that they kind of fit what we were trying to do. Yeah, Rodney Gunn, Jr., uh, is who uh, we were talking about from Lenore Ryan, down near where I'm from uh, in Charlotte. 19.6 points per game, and he scored 1,183 points uh, for the Bears there. Uh, as far as he goes, talk about uh, as a shooter, what, where he's going to lend uh, maybe the most to you. I know it's probably going to be on the three-point line. Well, you know, he's an interesting uh, player. Uh, you know, he tore his ACL coming out of high school, and that's probably why he ended up in Division II. He's 6'7", 245 pounds, so he's not slight. 
He's kind of lived at the three line. He shot a high percentage at the three line, but we feel like he can take the, you know, if people start switching the ball screen on him, he can take those littler guys inside too, because he's a strong guy. So, and I think he's going to have a chip on his shoulder because he's got a lot to prove. Uh, so we've been impressed with him. He's, he is coming off a little cleanup of his knee. So he's not in terrific condition yet, but he's a, he's a fantastic young man. And I think that's the key. Uh, and I think he has a lot to prove to people. Right. As, as you go in, uh, you know, to the off season, into workouts and things, what are some things that have stood out to you about this entire group? Well, uh, you know, I've been impressed with our young freshman guards. Uh, you know, we were fortunate enough that a lot of those freshmen, those, those high school kids, those prep school kids weren't really seen very much. And so we took two, two guards, Primo Spears from uh, Mount Zion, and then Jackie Johnson from Hargrave. Uh, yeah. And obviously, Ken, you know Hargrave's past. He averaged 27 points a game on their post-grad team. Sure. And I think a lot of the big boys were a little scared of him because he's 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 and they really didn't get a lot of look at him. You mm -hmm. know, so – we feel like both those guys are really going to be key for our team and also have a great chance to play a lot early. Uh, and they're both a little bit different. You know, Jackie's a dynamic long range scorer and Primo's a defensive oriented uh, guard. So I think those guys are going to be key for us along with Tyson Acuff and Mikey Bikelja to make sure we're good enough in the backcourt really to, you know, be a championship level team. As you've looked at the transfer portal and uh, recruited now, is there a feeling that maybe high school players are getting squeezed out a little bit with so much going on, you know, up front? So when I was at Akron in 13 years, we had, uh, we had two junior college players and three transfers. We built wow. it on four year guys. And I think that's, that, that's gone that day, that ship sailed. I don't really see that happening anymore, especially at the mid to, to high mid level, uh, I think, you know, it's more of a two year rent a player. Uh, it's like the G League. It's sad, but that's kind of what it's been to. So we've had to change gears and dynamics and kind of built it a little bit differently, which also affects style of play because, you know, you can't be as you can't you have to be more simple now because you're not going to have them for as long. So I think, you know, coaches like me who are 62 years old, older coaches that have coached a long time have to change gears or you're going to get left in the dust. Yeah, and, you know, it may be something to the attrition, you know, so many guys retiring, I think, this year. And and really, you know, just like you say, the older coaches, it, it, they just may not want to deal with this anymore. I don't think there's any question, Ken. I think, you know, guys are fed up with it. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen all kinds of different quotes, you know. You know, I, I saw Tubby Smith said, for instance, you know, all we're teaching our kids to do now is to quit. You know, the first sign of trouble, they quit and transfer. So, you know, while I, I'm in favor of the open transfer, the one-time transfer, because I think other sports get it, so our guys should get it. Right. I'm not necessarily sure that it's good for all those kids to transfer. Like, you can't have 1,710 guys on the transfer portal and say that's a good thing, because obviously not all 17, 1,710 should have transferred. Definitely. It, it's, it is. It's more of an AAU mentality. It is. And I think, you know, uh, uh, it's not only basketball, but it's, you know, it's, it's divorce rate. It's first sign of adversity, you know, guys giving up, you know, it's, it's blaming others and not holding yourself accountable. It's, it's entitlement. Uh, so again, like, I don't want to sound like some old stodgy guy, but yeah. you know, uh, I have a son that's a 26 year old professional soccer player. And we talk about it all the time because he has some younger kids on, on his team as well. So it's, it's, it's just something that's different and we have to adjust to it, but I'm, I'm not necessarily thinking it's, it's all a good thing. Now, coach, you guys are going to go into the UMPC Cooper Fieldhouse to start this season. How is it going to feel to at least right now be alleviated to the pandemic? Now you've got a solid roster in place, and now you get your new digs. So, Ken, look, had I known I was going to be out of the arena for two years, I probably would have stayed at Akron. Uh, <laughs> because of the pandemic, it took an extra year to get that arena built. Uh, yeah. And we practice in the rec center every single day, which it's a great rec center, but it's not ideal for 
you know, guys having to bring their gym bag every day to get to practice. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was a tough deal. And then you, you couple that with the pandemic and then the racial strife in our country. Sure. And, you know, it was a very, very difficult time and a difficult time to coach and a difficult time to play as well. Uh, so I felt for our players and I, but I also felt for us because it was yeah. hard, but being in the arena is really going to help us. Uh, it certainly isn't a cure all. We're still going to have to play great basketball, but uh, having a home court will help. Coach, talk a little bit about that arena. Take us inside of it. What will it feature? So uh, when they told me they were going to renovate the arena, I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, I don't know how great they can make it. Like how, how much can you really change it? But they did an unbelievable job. Uh, I never thought it could be as good as it is. They took one side of the arena, made it club level, suite level, uh, you know, and made it like a professional arena. But the thing I like best about it, it's an angry arena. It's right on top of you. There's not a bad seat in the house. Uh, and I just think it's going to be a very difficult place to play, especially if we could put fans in it, which obviously is a twofold thing. One, we have to win enough games and two, we have to market it correctly. So I think, you know, it's going to be a hard place. Coach, as we look at uh, the portal and other huge changes, the name, image, and likeness, which, uh, you know, I've said for years and years, it's high time these kids got a piece of the pie coming out of uh, so much money being made and then so much being taken away by the NCAA to line their own coffers. How do you think universities will go about implementing this program to deal with it? So we were kind of on the cutting edge of that. There's a guy in Pittsburgh that has a creative agency that approached us. And so we hired him as our brand coach. So, and again, I'm looking at it a little bit more long-term than maybe some people are. All I care about is that these guys, you know, when they're done playing have created a brand that will help them, you know, uh, get jobs and have great opportunities to have great lives. Right. Uh, I'm not looking at it as much short-term, but obviously guys are going to make a lot of money. Some of them, in the short term, if they really know how to market themselves, understand, uh, un understand social media. And so we've got an expert on it. And I think that's going to really be a, a key ingredient. And it's going to change a whole dynamic of college sports, really. Uh, again, it's going to be hard to manage. I mm -hmm. think that's going to be the hardest thing is, you know, because what are we allowed to do? Who are we allowed to, you know, uh, what is our role going to be? Because obviously we know all the donors. Yeah. And so like, I, again, it opens up a can of worms as to how it's going to be, you know, really uh, monitored. Last thing, coach, as far as a recruiting tool, can this become a huge recruiting tool? And are you guys allowed to mention this as you recruit? Yeah, we're allowed to mention it. Yeah. We're not allowed to have any, uh, we're not allowed to put them in touch with the people, uh, but yeah, it's going to be a huge recruiting tool. Uh, you know, I was told that Ohio State football players, for instance, when they played their last bowl game and their eligibility was done and they were going to get drafted, were making four or $500,000 at car dealerships, signing autographs. Yeah. You know, the weird thing is going to be that when the defensive back that's a first, a late first round draft pick is making $100,000 and, and a lottery pick is making $500,000, how, how is that managed? You yeah. know, it's going to be hard on the coach as well. Uh, but these guys are going to make a lot of money at certain places. Can you imagine an Alabama football player, an Ohio State football player, you know, a lottery pick, like let's say LeBron James is in college for one year. Yeah. Like how much money are those guys going to make? It's going to be a boatload. Mm -hmm. Coach Keith Dambrot, one of our favorite guests on your coach. Thanks for joining me this morning. I know you got a busy day ahead and I look forward to talking to you again soon. It's always my pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for having me, Kent.